Friend hey. of the show. Oh, you're going to be Jackson Jackson? I'll be Jackson. Okay. Friend of the show, Second Amendment activist and award-winning author, John Petrolino is next. Let's see what kind of shenanigans the Penn Patriot has been up to. All right, but first, if you own a gun in California, you should have an attorney that specializes in California gun laws on your speed dial. Because if you ever have legal matters that involve firearms, you need California's firearm lawyer, John Dillon. Especially if you have questions about red flag laws, gun registration, gun transportation, or maybe you just need to know that your guns are California compliant. Our trusted firearms attorney is John Dillon. John Dillon specializes in California gun laws. Put his number on your phone right now, 760-642-7150. That's John Dillon. That's John Dillon, California firearms lawyer, 760-642-7150. And before we go to John Petrolino, Petrolino, easy for for me me to say, say. uh, I need to announce the member that won the CCW certification course from Mike Pettengill, who was, of course, on the show a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. which was a great interview. Mike Pettengill was a really great He's interview. Really I, was, I, I watched him uh, at the meeting yesterday, too, give a Stop the Bleed uh, mm-hmm. uh, course, and uh, what a great guy. So his company is Personal Protection Academy, and the winner is <laughs> Sasha Tra- Travasos. I hope I said that wrong. I just know her as Sasha. <laughs> yeah, I just call her Sasha. Congratulations, Sasha. We'll get a hold of you later. Make sure that you get your prize. Yeah. All right. Without further ado, one of my favorite guys in the whole world. Hey, you said I was. I, I, well, I said one of. Oh, That's gotcha. Why. So one of. <laughs> one of my favorite guys in the whole world. Really, really, truly uh, great and talented uh, writer and author and uh, just an all-around great guy. And he's been so helpful. Such a good friend to Gun Owners Radio and San Diego County Gun Owners, Inland Empire Gun Owners. Orange County Gun Owners, John Petrolino, the Penn Patriot. How are you, man? Hi, Michael. How are you tonight? Fantastic. How are you? I'm doing very well. It's it's great to be back on the show with you guys. I really appreciate the invite. Dave, so John is uh, way smarter than I am. Yeah, well. We know that. Yeah. So he, he says to me about an hour ago, he goes, hey, man, you want me to come on at, and he throws out this big, huge, like, you know, number at me. And I'm like I'm like I'm like I had to, I'm sitting there looking it up trying to figure out what time he he's like you want me to come on at forty seven thousand hundred and twenty two I'm like what is did he, he use military time yes and you couldn't figure it out and I said we need you to call it at four four p I didn't even say I didn't even say Pacific time Dave yeah. let, me, let me help you twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen yeah I said four ten California time four ten <laughs> he likes to do that he asserts his, his I'm just uh, curious how many pins he's gone through <clears throat> how many pens. <laughs> Yeah. The Penn Patriot? I can imagine he's gone through boxes. Well, <laughs> it made you think about well, it. Yeah, really. I, I, I'm using my, my laptop a ah, lot more now, Dave, ah. than, than the pens, but, <laughs> the, you know, it's, it's all good. Hey, don't feel bad. I, I was telling somebody on uh, on TV when I do my little – no, on radio. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll get you the show. We'll put it on a thumb drive, you know, or a CD. And everybody says, a what? <laughs> a thumb drive? Come on, Dave. Get into the 20th century. But anyway, what can I say? <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So let, let's talk. Let's. I, I want to. There's so much I want to talk to you about, John. Um, there's so much we can talk about, and I'll bet you we could go on for hours and hours. But let's just kind of start. Tell people where, if, if people want to see what you write, people want to follow you. Where, where are they going to see you most, or what's what's your website, or where you know who do you write for? Give a little background. Sure. So um, my my webpage is thepenpatriot.com. Uh, the, the best actual way to follow me is on my link tree, link uh, tr.ee forward slash uh, J Petrolino III. Um, and I believe there's a link to that uh, on my website. And uh, the places where I primarily write are going to be Bearing Arms uh, and Ammo Land. Those are where I, I do most of my work. I also uh, write and do some articles for the Second Press. And also, there's a new site that I've been. I, I just did an article for called News2A.com, and uh, our good friend Charlie Cook also has an article out on uh, News2A.com. And I definitely want to give a big shout out to those guys because they're uh, they're in it. This uh, group of Jersey guys that saw an issue that and it was great. They were fed up, so they did something and they created their own site. And now they're putting out more two-way journalism. So maybe we'll see some more out of there 
Uh, but primarily, uh, if you if you want to find me, my website's a good place. And then, of course, Facebook, uh, The Pen Patriot. The Pen Patriot on Facebook. Now, how did you get into writing? I've always been interested in writing. It's always it's been something that I've been drawn to. I say always, like since like high school. So, um, and I've been actively writing for over twenty three years now. Um, journalism in the two A world since like twenty fifteen. So, um, but I've always been drawn to it. Well, how did, I guess that's the real question: is how did you transition from someone who likes to write to someone who's getting published? That's a great question, Mike. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so the, I should have my own radio show or something. Right? You there's should. A, there's a <laughs> there's a moniker of uh, saying you know you've got to get published, you've got to be published to get published, and and there's a little bit of truth in that. Uh, with the two way stuff, I really wasn't pursuing it, which is funny. I I um, stumbled upon an advertisement actually. Uh, for a site that's out there today. Now, they didn't publish my work, but they gave me marching orders, and they're like, yeah, we'll give you a shot. I wrote an article, and then the guy uh, completely cold-shouldered me, and uh, he just completely ghosted me, and I was like, I had this great article that I put a lot of time into, and uh, and a long story short is I actually reached out to the the guys at Ammoland, got with uh, Freddie Real over there, and he and I had a chat and he said he would give me a give me a shot, and uh, you know he kind of published it. And then from there, it was just a matter of submitting and trying to build relationships. So that you know it takes some time. That part of it must be tough. I mean, I've you know had to do some writing for the organization, and you do you do a bunch of research, and you do a bunch of you know brain dumps, and and then you do a bunch of editing, and then you ask somebody to take a look. Anyway, you pour your heart and soul into this thing, you know. And then it takes – you put it out there, and it takes somebody, you know, two and a half minutes to read it, you know, and then it's over. And it's like, ah, oh, all that – you know, like, how do you how do you deal with that? You know what I mean? Is it is it kind of a letdown, you know, after – First and foremost, don't read the comments. That's my first advice is do not read the comments uh, and definitely uh, bask in the, in the sunshine of praise when you do get it. I think for me now it's – you know, because I put out – I put out a lot of work now, not as much as some people. So, like, you know, over at Bearing Arms, you have Cam Edwards and Tom Knighton, and these guys are pumping out six-plus articles a day. I mean, these guys are machines. Now, granted, this is what they do for a living. I mean, this is my side hustle. But still, for my side hustle, um, I did the math. It was um, with with Ammo Land. I've been with Ammo Land for, like, two and a half years officially – with a byline where, okay, this is my home, this is where I can hang my tile. And bearing arms, it was two years ago on last Sunday that I had signed my papers with Salem to be a quote-unquote consultant to do writing for them. And where I'm at is, in that two years, I've written probably 500 Second Amendment articles, Mike. Wow. And yeah, so I I write it, I put it out there, and I move on. Now there are some articles that I feel have, you know, if it's not just an opinion piece or something that's trying to debunk um, some bad reporting or you know point out hypocrisy. If we're doing something like some of the work that you and I have talked about in the past, like some harder news reporting, like the things that were going on in California or. Uh, that member the training organization that was kind of a little bit less than authentic, <laughs> you know. So certain articles like that, I'll definitely push more, and maybe I'm looking for more of a response. But I'm kind of at the point where I just write it, I put it out, and then I move on, and I hope for the best. You yeah. know. What's the what is the what's like the best kind? I know you said don't read the comment section, but you and I both know that we we read the comment section. <laughs> Do you, or I don't know. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're sincere. But is there a comment? What's what's like the best comment you've ever read under uh, under your under a, a story you did? The the article. I think it was the article on that company that was doing inauthentic advertising for their training. Yeah. Lee, Lee Williams commented, and Lee uh, said that this was like great reporting. So for me, that was like wow. really tremendous because I really respect Lee. I think he's a hell of a journalist. He's a real news guy. 
um, and I have a lot of respect for him. So getting a comment like that from Lee was like really a big boost. Um, that's awesome. So far, that's been one of the best. And yeah. it, it also feels good when you see people like sharing your work. So when you find it in the wild, you're like, oh, I, I know that guy. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> my, can I tell you what my favorite comment was when I read the comment section? Yeah, go ahead. I, uh, um, we did this. It was actually it was for a, a TV appearance. We did a press conference. And I think I probably told this story before, but it still cracks me up. Um, one of the TV stations started started uh, uh, broadcasting early. And uh, I'm standing up there. It's, it's like July. I'm in a suit. It's hot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so they're like, hey, we're going to start in 30 seconds or whatever, right? And I'm like, okay. So I grab a towel and, uh, you know, wipe my face off and get all ready to go. Well, this TV station, like I said, was already broadcasting. So the first comment was, he's sweating bullets. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mike, when you were telling the story, I thought you were going to come up with your favorite comment that somebody made about my work. I, I didn't know. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> everything, no. everything I see about you, everybody respects your work. I don't ever see any criticism. I, you do such a good, I, thorough job. I don't know, Michael. I, it's funny because I get some weird hate mail from, once in a while. Hmm. I did a story on the New York State Jewish Gun Club. Mm -hmm. I started getting, like, anti-Semitic hate mail. Um, oh, there was one time I did a story that I had an anonymous source, and, and the source was an elected official. So, like, I was trying to be very careful to cloak their identity, and I used non-gendered language to really cloak who this individual was. Somebody sent me hate mail accusing me of, you, you know, being woke. <laughs> and uh, not using gendered language. I said, look, this was a, an anonymous tipster. I said, I'm taking it to the extreme where I don't want to, you know, divulge the person's gender. And I think, you know what? I think that's fair, you know? Yeah, that's that's ridiculous. Anti-Semitic? Yeah, so like, who's anti it's, it's, yeah. What is it? It's 2023. Like, who's who's anti-Semitic in 2020? Cracks me up. Like, what what world are we living in? Like, catch up, guys. <laughs> All right, so I want to talk to you about some of your articles, John, specifically. Um, as, uh, well, we'll talk about when when we get back, but there's... Uh, that sounds some, good to yeah. me. Okay, perfect. Hey, Orange County Gun Owners is dedicated to preserving and restoring Orange County's self-defense rights. And if you live in Orange County and you want to help defend and restore the Second Amendment... You need to join ocgunowners.com slash join. Orange County Gun Owners is a do-something organization to restore and defend the Second Amendment. Volunteer at a shooting social at a gun shop, tabletop, to help more pro-gun local officials get elected. Save the date. Orange County Gun Owners prom is May 20th. You need to become a member, and you can do it by joining ocgunowners.com slash join. All right, we're back with the pen patriot, John Petrolino. So, John, you, um, I, like you said, this is a side hustle. Um, it's you know, it's very, it's very niche um, writing. Um, but how much do you pay attention to, um, you know, the media in general? Like, how much do you, you know, follow other media and uh, you know, kind of stay up on 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 not so much stories of the day, but like media stories. Does that make sense? Like, did you follow the Twitter thing and? And, uh, you know, do you kind of do you weigh in and have opinions on that sort of stuff? So I have a news ticker for like half a dozen or more news apps on my phone. So I'm constantly getting bombarded by mainstream media news ticker items. So if there's something going on in the country, I'm finding out about it just as organically as everyone else. So I follow the news. So then obviously if something, you know, tickles my fancy, uh, you know, I'll I'll take a read into it. As for Twitter and um, social media, and if you mean like social media as a source of news, I kind of do cruise the pages. I find a lot of really, really good stuff actually on Facebook. I know it's like the OK Boomer thing here, <laughs> but Facebook, I really do get a lot of good news tips out of that. Um, and I find that to be beneficial to, to be engaged and then, of course, there's people like you got the army of people that are out there that are sending tips over. So, well, that's, that's also helpful. Specifically, I mean, you're you're you know you're a media figure. You're somebody that's that's you know pumping out uh, stories and and doing research and that sort of thing. So when I was talking about Twitter, I meant like uh, you know the when they dumped you know Matt Taibbi 
um, got to evaluate all the um, Twitter emails and, and found out the relationship between tw- Twitter and the and the government. Did you follow that story much? I mean, I just a little bit, not not a whole lot, because again, I'm looking at mostly Second Amendment news, so. You know, maybe I kind of pigeonhole myself, but th- this does obviously it affects us because what was going on at Twitter um, regulated Second Amendment related news. So, uh, but I didn't dive deep into that. Yeah, eh, I thought it was interesting. I mean, just the relationship and and the way media is going these days, and that's kind of where I was going with these <laughs> questions. Is you know. 10, 15, 20 years ago, you couldn't ha- you couldn't really have, like, you know, maybe you had somebody that was kind of producing like a local newsletter or something like that, but the ability for reporting to be someone's side hustle and that person to be an expert on what they're writing on and that content to make it to all 50 states, you know, in a meaningful, timely way, that's new. And I think it's extremely valuable. And I think it's what you're doing and, and folks like you, it, it's, uh, you know, I think it's put, uh, you know, kind of mainstream media. Yeah, I, I hate that term. It's it's kind of become such a – but it's put mainstream media on notice that, hey, you guys don't control the airways anymore. You know, there are people well, like John Petrolino that can really mm-hmm. research this stuff and really get to the bottom of it and care about quality. You're you're right, and there we are now uh, probably as far as information age, like at the most powerful point that we've been ever, right, in in, in history. And it's funny that you talk about mainstream media and that moniker. I'm not really in love with it either, because when you say mainstream media, what does that make me? That doesn't make me (laughs) right. All right, I'm not mainstream, but I mean, I'm kind of media, you know. Uh, so am I just like less than mainstream media? Am I, you know, your deep water um, media, <laughs> deep water deep. media, <laughs> um, but, but 100% Michael, uh, voices are being empowered today in ways that weren't imaginable. Like you said, like 15 plus years ago, you had people that were blogging and stuff like that. Absolutely. But today I feel like it's lickety split. Yeah. And which is good and bad. In your case, it's it's phenomenal. It's great that we get to have this voice, someone that knows what they're talking about, someone that gets to the bottom of, the, of stories that maybe mainstream media would just kind of slough off. But on the other hand, um, you know, anybody with a with a keyboard, you know, um, and it, it kind of muddies the water. And uh, I think that it's it's easier for people to wind up and stay in their own bubble too. But you know the good and the bad it's it's it feels like we're in this like transition er, you know era it feels like 10 15 20 years from now we'll have it figured out but right now we're kind of i don't know we're kind of feeling our way through the dark you know <laughs> well i'm afraid about 10 15 years down the line with uh automatically generated articles through ai and things like that so 10, 15 years down the line, we might be looking at some tremendously scary stuff where, you know, my job might be just editing something that AI created, and then that becomes my article because I fact-checked it. And that would be awful, in my opinion, because I do have a writing style um, that I'd like to think is not easily to replicate, and it's a writing style that not everyone likes. I, I know that. Uh, but the people that like it do like it a lot. So, how would you describe your writing style? I guess it's. I definitely am in the in the camp of like the new journalism. I put myself into the story, good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, yeah, I'll write a lot of stuff third person and more, you know, impersonal. But I consider myself like new journalism. Like the some of the articles that. Um, that you highlighted one of them. I mean, I was there, you know, I was present for it. And not only was I present for it, you know, the people that are there that were plaintiffs in that court case, I'm members of those organizations. So uh, by default, I'm part of the story, just like you always say this. And it's great. I love that you say this. You say, if you're a member of San Diego County gun owners, you're a part of this lawsuit. So that's part of history. Yeah, truly. 
Okay, so let's talk about some of your articles. And I want to I want to take you. We, we have a few <coughs> minutes left in this segment. Then we're going to take you over to the next segment too. Oh, um, cool. That's your fault. You've been interesting, so we're punishing you by uh, keeping you on longer. So you know my requirements. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't worry. <coughs> um, so uh, the study uh, you wrote an article that says study finds patterns in instances of mass slash active shooters. Talk about that article. Well, first of all, the study used people from California. So I'm sorry to <laughs> to put that out there, but okay, so now we're doing this based off of California uh, gun owners or uh, California-related so-called mass shooting or active shooting events. And my issue with the seed study and the article that was going on here is the reporting that attracted me to the study is talking about mass shootings and active shooting events. And, you know, right there, it took me like 30 minutes to meander through all that because there's a difference between what's considered a mass shooting and what's considered an active shooting event, an active shooting event as defined by the FBI versus mass shooting defined by whomever. Right. So there's all that problem. And then they're coming up with these criteria to say from like the, the 80s and the 90s to present date, what are some of these hallmarks of somebody that might be a mass shooter or an active shooter? And, you know, one of them was like, oh, you know, uh, that individual spent the last uh, year or last couple of months buying lots of handguns or they bought a rifle. I'm like, oh, OK, like this is some real brainiac stuff. But yeah. even if we want to look at their findings on what they're saying uh, they breathe oxygen, right? right? None of that matters. Like, you, you know what? Their findings, in my opinion, don't matter at all because there was only 22 test cases. So how are you going to do a study with 22 test cases that span decades? Well, I, 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 you, one thing I really think we need to do, and I don't know how to do it. I don't know what who's the most appropriate, but you, you, you brought it up uh, just now, and I, I think it's extremely important. Um, for communication and to to figure out how we're going to solve the problem, that we need we need better terminology. They use you know mass shooting or school shooting or whatever, and then come to find out, you know if if uh, you know five gang members uh, meet in the street and uh, you know uh, another five gang members and they all shoot each other, that's a mass shooting. And if they do it, you know a hundred yards from school, it's a school shooting. You know, it's like, well, wait a minute. That's that's not those are, uh, you know, 10 career criminals that are uh, doing what career criminals do, trying to solve that problem, you know, by and, and with the same steps we're taking to solve the problem of a, you know, of a of a of some, lo you know, loner who's got mental issues and he goes into a school during school hours and, and shoots the place up. They're, they're completely and totally different solutions. They're completely and totally different um, situations. But, you know, the other side, the anti-Second Amendment side, the anti-gun side, it behooves them and benefits them at, you know, to pad the numbers by calling these all, you know, one thing. All these are mass shootings. And I do think right. we, we, we got it. We, I don't know. We got to better define this stuff. We got to come up with we should probably, we being the gun owner community, should probably be the you know, the thought leader on this thing. We should probably take a leadership role and say, hey, look, you know, we have five different terms with five different, uh, you know, definitions because we're going to need five different, you know, solutions to solve these problems. And, and maybe the answer to that is legislatively. You know, I, I don't know. Like to actually have legislation written to define these things on a federal level and get with the agencies, you know, the criminal justice di di division and say, look, these are the definitions and these are the terms. Because we know places like the gun violence archives and, and all of those places are very inauthentic. They are, you know, purposefully inflating their numbers and they rely on just conjecture and, and media reports and not to be like, hey, you can't trust the media. But I'm like, if you're going to use the media and a media report that hasn't been confirmed – through uh, police action or police reporting, that's wrong. That's not a statistic. That's just a rumor. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. So, what what kind of reaction did you get from your article? Did, was it uh, was it positive? Did you get some pushback, or 
How did it go over? No, I think that one went over pretty well. And it was funny because somebody that I, I was doing a radio show with last week had sent me the seed on that, and we didn't even discuss it after I wrote the article. It was pretty funny. Hey, did you know we have a world-class flight training school right here in San Diego? Pilots can fly almost every day, which makes San Diego one of the best places to learn how to fly in the world. Learn to fly with San Diego Flight Training International. You can check out this deal just for gun owner radio listeners. Check it out. One hour of ground school, one hour of flight. Actually fly with an instructor, normally $400. For you listeners, $350. Getting started is super easy. Call 858-569-1822 or learn to fly with SDFTI. Call today at 858-569-1822. You know, Talking, so I, I may up? try that. I go up there every Saturday and say yeah. I get a free flight. You get a free flight every every Saturday. <laughs> like, hey, can you guys get me to L.A.? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> hey, I need to go to Denver. You got, to, you got anybody going that way? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. All right. Hey, are you going to do Action Jackson's question to the man? W- what's your favorite gun? Yeah. All right, sure. Action Jackson, if you're listening, this is for you, bud. Uh, John Petrolino, the Penn Patriot, what's your favorite gun? I'm not answering that. Jackson's not asking. That. Ah, <laughs> good point. You know what's funny? Uh, so we were at uh, we were at an, a grand opening for Five Eleven yesterday, which went Tactical. really really well. Five Eleven Tactical went really really well. <laughs> the, the the mayor of El Cajon, Bill Wells. Oh, I, was he there? He was there. Introduced him to uh, uh, introduced him to uh, Jackson. Yeah. And uh, you know he said, "Oh, hey, how's it going?" And immediately the mayor said, "Oh yeah, my favorite gun is." <laughs> Just launched right in. Didn't even get an opportunity to ask. <laughs> Did he get the key to Love the city? It. No, he didn't get the key to the city. But. No, man. So, John, what 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 article have you been uh, – what's one that really stuck out in the last uh, few months? What's one that you're particularly proud of that you really want to draw attention to? So, something I did that was, was a first for me. It was pretty cool. I went to court. Um, as you know, that – New Jersey, much like New York, wrote a carry killer bill to yeah. squish what level of carry we have in the state. And uh, we we're challenging that law, and uh, it's in federal court. And there's a temporary restraining order on, on the carry killer law. Well, a couple of weeks ago on a Friday, um, I, get the, I guess it would have been not this last Friday, the Friday before, uh, they were having a hearing for the pre- preliminary injunction, mm-hmm. and uh, I went to Camden. I went down to uh, the federal courthouse, and I sat in and listened to ANJRPC and SAF and um, uh, who else was there, FPC, and all the other organizations uh, litigating against this horrible law against the state, and that was pretty cool for me. Wow. What what stuck out in the in the process? Was there something that— Stuck out or surprised you? What really um, – well, it was neat because I felt like I'm in like a TV show now, like watching the court battle go on. I've, I've, I've never sat in court for anything other than maybe like a minor traffic ticket. So mm-hmm. um, this was a new thing. So to sit in federal court, that was pretty cool. Um, the judge was really awesome, Judge Bum, and she actually – if you could get your hands on like the transcript of the audio recordings that are out there, you can see that she was really, I'm not going to say 100% on our side because like our side is almost like zero regulations. (laughs) (laughs) If if I had to take a stab at it, I don't think we're going to get to a point in my lifetime where like, whoa, 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 we've taken them, taken away too many restrictions. We're going to have to stop taking away restrictions. I don't think we're ever going to see that in my lifetime. But Judge Baum uh, basically called out the state a couple of times, and one of the times she said it at the end because they had litigators there also representing the Senate president and the Assembly speaker. Like they wanted to intervene in the case because they were afraid the state was going to screw it up. Well, let me tell you something. The guy that they brought out, I think I – I referred to him as standing there like a brick wall and his arguments and uh, everything that he had to say made him sound as obtuse as one of the bricks in that wall uh, because this guy was bad. Uh, And she basically said to him, you know, the state's you're basically telling me the state's stance is we don't want anybody to have guns, period. And uh, 
It was pretty glaring to wow. hear the judge actually say that. And she she took some shots also at the AG. Our AG had sent like a letter saying, basically, listen, you guys need to speed up this, you know, injunction process because we're going to go over your head to the to the Third Circuit and we're going to, you know, file for an appeal for the TRO. And she wrote a nice scathing letter back basically saying, you're the ones who gave me the timeline. So, you know, mind your P's and Q's. And uh, it was funny. So at the end of the you know proceedings, it was like we were there like four, four and a half hours. It was a long day. And the, the gallery was filled with members of the coalition of New Jersey firearms owners. It was all gun people in there. There was two other reporters and they were all gun people. It was really great. Mark Cheeseman, who was a plaintiff in several cases, was there and a bunch of other great patriots. And uh, she had said uh, when they were giving orders on – uh, to the attorneys, like, I want 10 more pages out of you guys because we didn't get to cover everything. And, uh, you know, the state asked her, you know, well, when did you want to have these 10 pages back? She says, you tell me. I don't want to be accused of being too slow. <laughs> so do, do she you, really I, – do you, now, do, you, uh, it, do you – I, I really truly wonder, and I don't think – you and I probably don't have enough experience being in front of judges, thankfully. Yeah. Um, to, to really answer this question, I really do wonder if there are any judges out there that aren't left or right. I really truly wonder if there are some legitimately pure judges out there um, who, who uh, you know, no matter what their personal beliefs are, you know, uh, I don't know. It's just that it really does seem like it's it's a left or right world, you know, with, with these well, judges. So when it comes to biases, though, you know, I could sit here and say, well, she's not biased at all because she's looking at the Constitution. So does that make her a right judge or does that make her a just judge? I don't know. Um, they did get their orders. They've got their marching orders from the, the Supreme Court. And what states like New Jersey and New York have done since those marching orders came out is egregious. It's basically spitting in the face of the court. Yeah. You guys are on that crazy train soon. You guys are going to get hosed. Maryland's going to get hosed. Um, I think Hawaii's got a whole bunch of laws that uh, bills that are in queue. And I also think next year, my suspicion is Massachusetts is also going to be getting canned. You know, I think they're going to get it pretty bad because you look at all of these left of center administrations, they're just going apoplectic. And the fact of the matter is, this is only a couple of isolated cities that have these strongholds in these states that really push the agenda in certain areas. Like <laughs> Illinois is the perfect example, right? Why, why, why is Illinois the perfect example? Well, Chicago. I mean, Chicago runs the state. Yeah. Massachusetts, Boston runs the state. So outside of Boston and, say, Springfield and Worcester, a couple of other cities, there's not tremendous metropolitan areas uh in mass you know massachusetts is run by boston new york is run by new york city so you have these giant population centers that are driving the bus and they can't handle that like let's say in new york you have a whole population of people carrying guns with no problems all over upper state new york or upstate new york massachusetts is like 95 percent with shall issue in practice, there was a couple of areas that created problems, but those problem areas, and it's no different with California, yeah. th those problem areas are going to go and they're going to ruin it for the people that actually had their permit. I mean, I was able to get my permit in New Jersey finally, and now they basically nullified it with a new law, but now it's on a temporary restraining order. So this is like a divorce that I just want to see play out and be over and done with. It really is. And that really is. It's not. I. I. There. I, I. You know. I haven't fully fleshed this out yet, but it needs to be fleshed out. It's not left versus right. It's not Republican versus Democrat. It's not conservative versus liberal. It's not progressive versus libertarian. It's really. Uh, if you really look at it, it's rural versus uh, urban, and 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 because it's the same in Arizona. It's the same in Nevada. It's the same in in uh, you know in every state. It's these. You know, the big cities are the ones, you know, you look at Texas, you know, you look at, you know, Houston, Austin, Dallas, you know, they're, they're totally different than the rest of the state. You look at Florida, 
which is very gun friendly. But the only reason it's gun friendly is because Miami hasn't uh, outgrown the rest of Florida yet. But even, you know, Miami and Orlando, you know, those populations. And I don't really know. Maybe someone's already studied this. Are people that live in, in cities different because they live in cities or do different people move to cities? You know, I don't know. That's a good question. You know what I mean? And I, I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think people that live on top of each other tend to behave differently. And then if you're and then and then, you know, and then also attract people that want to behave differently. So it, it kind of compounds the, the the issue. But it's it really is an extreme. And I've talked about this before in in California. Um, you know, the fact that we don't have uh, you know, our Senate is now they redraw districts according to population, which was not the design of the Constitution. And so we really don't have a bicameral house. It's just a majority rule state. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I just drove. I just did a big trip from Redding uh, all the way down to San Diego and following the five. There were signs all over the place talking about the drought and, then, hey, you know, governor, give us water. And that's those are the kind of issues that, that crop up when L.A. and San Francisco run the whole state. You know, they don't – it's not just guns or, or even taxes. You know, you start – uh, you know, rural areas have very, very different needs than than uh, uh, than the cities. But anyway, John, you're awesome, man. I awesome. can't say enough good about you. I think we're going to see you at Gun Prom, aren't we? We'll see. I'm not really sure yet. I haven't. That sounds like a yes. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> I will, we'll see. Thanks for watching this clip from Gun Owners Radio. You can watch us live every Sunday from 4 to 6 p.m. California time right here on our YouTube channel. Or if you're in the San Diego area, you can listen to us on 1170 AM. We're also available on your favorite podcast platform for free. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you can help restore and protect the Second Amendment, not just in California, but across the country.